As we begin this unit, we're going to be taking a look at how adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and uracil build codons, anticodons. We're going to talk about mRNA, tRNA, and the best place to start is at the beginning. In this podcast, we're going to take a look at the difference between DNA and RNA. So how does DNA differ from RNA? Well, remember, DNA is a set of code that holds all your genetic information, but how does it actually decode that information? Well, DNA has the code, but it doesn't use it. RNA puts the code into action. Now, DNA copies the base sequence and turns it into RNA, which is a ribonucleic acid. It then uses these instructions to direct the production of proteins, which help determine an organism's characteristics. So, comparing RNA and DNA. Well, DNA is made up of a 5-carbon sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitro nitrogenous base. That means the base is made of nitrogen. Now, RNA is made up of the same, but there are three differences. The first one is the sugar in RNA is ribose instead of deoxyribose. The second thing is RNA is a single strand and not a double strand helix like DNA. And the third difference is RNA contains uracil in place of thymine. Now, these chemical differences make enzymes easy to tell the difference between the two. DNA is like a master plan of the cell. It is very valuable information. It's that master plan. RNA is a blueprint, which is simply a copy of the master plan, a little less valuable. If you lose a copy, no big deal. You can make another one. If you lose that master plan, it's all over. Now, DNA molecules stay inside the safety of the cell inside the nucleus. Now, RNA molecules go to protein building sites in the cytoplasm, which are the ribosomes. And if you think back to the beginning of uh, the year, we talked about ribosomes are the site of protein uh, building. Ribosomes make proteins. Now we're going to dive in depth and see how that is actually done. All right, functions of RNA. Now, RNA has many functions, but mainly one, protein synthesis, and that's why you find them at the site of ribosomes. Now, RNA controls the assembly of amino acids into proteins. Now, remember, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Now, there are three types of RNA. There's the first one that is mRNA, which is known as messenger RNA. It carries the copies of instructions for assembling amino acids into proteins. They carry information from the DNA to other parts of the cell. We also have what's called ribosomal RNA or rRNA. The proteins are assembled on ribosomes, which consist of two subunits. Now, the subunits are made up of ribosomal RNA and as many as 80 different proteins. And the last one we have is transfer RNA, which is known as tRNA. So when a protein is built, uh, when a protein is built, the RNA molecule transfers each amino acid to the ribosomes as the directions in the mRNA, mRNA say. And we'll dive into this uh, a little deeper a little later on. So transcription. Well, cells invest large amounts of raw materials and energy into making RNA. And making RNA takes place during what is called transcription. Now, segments of DNA serve as templates to produce complementary RNA molecules. And because the RNA is making a copy, we call this transcription. It's just like transcribing. You're going to copy exactly what it has, and that's what happens first. Now, in prokaryotes, the RNA is made in the cytoplasm and in eukaryotes inside the nucleus, and then it moves to the cytoplasm for protein synthesis. If you recall, notice it says eukaryotes inside the nucleus. In prokaryotes, they have no membrane-bound organelles, and because prokaryotes lack membrane-bound organelles, it's going to move straight into the cytoplasm, not into the nucleus, because it has no mem membrane-bound organelle, no membrane-bound nucleus. Now, transcription requires an enzyme called RNA polymerase, and that's how you pronounce that. It's polymerase. RNA polymerase binds the DNA during transcription and separates the DNA strand. Now, remember, there are two strands of DNA, and it's going to separate them. It then uses that one strand as a template to assemble nucleotides into a complementary strand of RNA. Now, this allows a single gene to produce hundreds or even thousands of RNA molecules. But when it says right here it uses that one strand, remember, DNA has two strands. It's a double helix. It's going to separate those two strands and use that one strand as a template to assemble nucleotides into a complementary strand of RNA. Now, if this sounds a little over your, over your head, don't worry. This is the basic 
background information that you're going to need. It will all make sense as we move on. All right, promoters. So how does RNA polymerase know where to start and stop making a strand of RNA? It, it's got to know where to start and where to end. Well, RNA polymerase doesn't bind to DNA just anywhere, but to those regions of DNA that have specific base sequences. These areas are called promoters. Promoters show the RNA polymerase exactly where to make the RNA. Now, similar signals tell it when to stop when a new RNA molecule is completed, and we'll talk about those later on as well. All right, RNA editing. Now, RNA molecules sometimes require a bit of editing before they can be read, similar to a rough draft of writing. Pre-mRNA molecules have bits and pieces cut out of them before they can go into action. These that are cut out are called introns. Now, in eukaryotes, introns are taken out of pre-mRNA while they are still in the nucleus. The remaining pieces, called exons, are then spliced back together to form the final mRNA. So why do cells use energy to make a large RNA molecule only to throw some of it away? And that is a great question, and the answer is, biologists don't know. They haven't figured that out yet. Science doesn't have the answer to everything. It will one day, but as of right now, it doesn't have the answer to this. Now, biologists don't know, but they do know that some molecules can be cut and spliced to make different tissues. Now, introns and exons can play a role in evolution, making very small changes to DNA, allowing sequences to have effects on how genes affect cell functions. So that's going to be the end of um, this podcast, which is uh, basic information. If you have any questions, you can always uh, post a comment, and we'll see you guys next time.